Hello and good afternoon everyone. This is your how to get the best from the Sony FS7 camcorder webinar. Thanks very much for joining us. It's good to see so many people attending and clicking through still, which is great. I'm Rob Newton and I'm your moderator for today. I work for Visual Impact doing all of the marketing. And before we get started, I just want to run through a few housekeeping bits and pieces. Um, you should have on your screen a question box. We encourage you to use it. It is an interactive session, so please send your questions throughout the presentation and we'll endeavor to answer them all at the end. We're also recording the webinar, um, which we'll send you tomorrow, which will include both the audio and the slides. You may not know, we also run open days, masterclasses, uh, product launches, etc., in Teleton and sometimes in Pinewood, where you can actually get your hands on the kit and see people like Alistair in person. So if you're interested, please check it out on our website, which is visuals.co.uk slash events. Okay, I'd like to introduce you now to Alistair. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, who, apart from being a certified Sony trainer, he's a DOP and cinematographer. And he today will give some great hints and tips on this fantastic camera, including some real world examples. Uh, before I hand over, I just want to do an audience poll, if that's okay. Um, this will help Alistair adapt his presentation to actually the profile of the audience we have today. So it's quite a simple question, really. Have you made the leap into 4K, uh, uh, large sensors? Um, basically, there's a yes already there, no, but almost there. In other words, you've probably already decided on what manufacturer, what camera to get, but you haven't quite purchase the camera yet, no, but we, we know we need one, or quite simply, not sure if it's for me, if 4K you is know, for you. So it'd be really good if you could just um, indicate which option suits you best. Uh, we'll leave this poll open for a few minutes as well. So if you haven't quite made up your mind, you can do it throughout the presentation. We'll leave it open for a few minutes. Okay, I'd like now to hand over to Alistair who will start the presentation. So uh, I shoot all kinds of things with various cameras. This is uh, one of the things that I, I shoot a lot of. In fact, I'm off tomorrow to the US to shoot tornadoes in the States. And um, so I have a lot of real world experience with the camera using it in run and gun, uh, fast, exciting sort of shooting environments. Now, one of the things I would like to introduce everyone to, if you haven't heard of them before, is all files. The camera has the ability to save a snapshot of the way the car camera is currently set up, and it's called an all file. And that allows you to switch very quickly between different ways of operating and using the camera. So, for example, you might have an all file that's set up for the Cine EI mode, and you might have another all file that's set up for slow motion shooting. And to switch between those different modes, you just load the appropriate all file. Now these are pretty easy to do. Um, you simply go to the file menu on the camera and under all file, first of all, you choose a name to give the all file and then you save that all file to an SD card in the camera. And then you can recall those at any time you want. And it's a really quick way to switch between different modes and different camera setups without having to remember a whole bunch of settings and other things. So I'd really recommend that when you have the camera set the way you like to use it, that you create an all file, save that, and it allows you to come back to that very quickly and very easily. Now, something else that's really important is calibrating your viewfinder, because if your viewfinder isn't correctly calibrated, you just don't know what you're looking at. So one of the first things to do with any camera really is to check the calibration of your viewfinder. And the camera has some SMPT bars built into it. And if we look at the um, viewfinder, um, Oops, sorry. If you look at the viewfinder, you will see um, down here in this area down here that there are some additional bars. These are called pluge bars. They're in the black. There is a minus 2% bar, a plus 2% and a plus 4% bar. And I've made them deliberately brighter in this slide so we can see them. And what you need to do is to set the uh, first of all, the contrast on the camera so that the 100% white box here stops getting brighter. So you increase your contrast until this stops getting brighter and that's where you leave the contrast. 
Then once you've done that, you use the brightness adjustment to set it so that this minus 2% bar should not be visible. You should just, and it is only going to be just, be able to see the plus 2%, but you shouldn't be able to see the minus 2. And when that's set like that, when your brightness is set like that, then your black level will be correctly set. So that sets the white, that sets your black. So your viewfinder contrast and brightness range will be correct. So what you're looking at in the viewfinder will be an accurate representation of what you're seeing. And at this point, I would just say, you know, please do ask questions. Um, the more questions we get from you, the better. So please use the question box to, uh, to ask away and we'll, uh, we'll try and uh, respond to those questions as we get them. Now, hypergammas, these are really good for shooting what I would call what you see is what you get. So that's for shooting on the run, um, no grading, no edit, no um, fancy color correction, or anything like that, just basically getting good pictures out of the camera. So these work in the custom mode. They're really simple to use. Um, they do grade. You can use the color correction tools that are available in most standard edit applications. You don't need a proper sort of grading tool like Resolve or anything like that. Um, another thing with these to consider those, you do need to expose them a little bit lower than you would do normally because they have a, a highlight roll off. And if you expose too bright, you'll put skin tones and things like that into that highlight roll off. And uh, that can uh, then affect um, your uh, exposure. So we have this highlight roll off here and this starts at about 70 percent. And if you go above this uh, point where the roll off is starting, your skin tones and faces and things start to become low contrast. So you want to keep faces and skin tones when using hypergammas just below this 70% uh, points. So you may just want to expose a little lower. Now, which hypergamma to use for, for what? Because there are six of them to choose from in the camera. Well, the numbers, the names of the hypergammas that you'll see in the menu, they actually tell you a lot about which hypergamma does what. So hypergamma num number one, as an example, in red, the first three digits of its name, the 325, is the dynamic range of that gamma curve compared to 709, that's our normal gamma. So we can see that hypergamma one is 325%, while hypergamma four is 460. So hypergamma four will deal with a bigger brightness range better than hypergamma number one. But one of the things to consider is Whenever you have a gamma curve with a bigger dynamic range, a bigger contrast range, the picture will be a bit flatter and a bit lower contrast. And then we have the fourth character, which is either a zero or a nine. And that zero represents a peak recording level of 100%. So if you're doing anything for broadcast safe, use one of the ones that goes to 100%, so with a zero there. And nine indicates 109%. So that may need some grading if it's for broadcast. And also you need to make sure that your edit application will pass stuff that goes to 109% really well. And then the last two characters, or the last three characters rather, they are the, the recommended middle gray level. So if you did have a gray card and we're exposing them with a gray card, that's the level the gray card would be exposed at. In fact, one of the things you'll find if you switch from 709, 709 normally has middle gray at 41%. Two hypergammas one through four, you'll see the picture get darker because they are designed to be exposed a little bit darker than standard gammas. So just a guide here as to an idea of which gammas work uh, for which applications. Hypergammas one and two, they're broadcast safe. Uh, number one for normal shooting, number two for high contrast. Hypergamma three, really good for normal or low light situations. Number four for high contrast. Hypergamma seven uh, for darker but very high contrast scenes. And then number eight for brighter, very high contrast scenes. One thing when using hypergammas, you do need to turn off the white clip in the camera's paint menu. Otherwise, it will clip at 104% and you won't get the full range, the full benefit that the hypergammas can give you. And generally when I'm shooting with the hypergammas, I typically expose about half to one stop lower than 709. So um, somewhere uh, around about sort of 65%, 60, 65% for your skin tones if you use zebras and, and things like that. Um, 
moving on. And good to see a few questions coming in. We're looking at those questions now and we'll, we'll sort out the ones that we're going to answer in a minute. We'll answer as many as we can, but keep those questions coming, please. Um, making Cine EI easy. So I like to use the Cine EI mode. This is the digital cinematography mode in the camera a lot. But a lot of people are afraid of using it. They think it might be too difficult. Um, I um, like to use it because it gives you that full maximum dynamic range of S-Log, S-Log 2 or S-Log 3. The easiest way to use it is to make use of the built-in 709-800 LUT. And to do that, you simply turn on the viewfinder LUTs and the SDI2 LUT. The main one of interest really is going to be the viewfinder LUT because you're going to be looking in the viewfinder at your pictures. And then set the LUT to the 709-800 LUT. And this gives you a normal 709 exposure in the viewfinder. So looking in the viewfinder or at your monitor, you simply expose using conventional normal levels. You don't need to remember any particular middle gray or white levels, because basically looking in the viewfinder or the monitor with 709, if the picture looks right, it is right. And because that 709 is directly related to the um, S-Log recording, it's basically always going to give you the correct S-Log recording as well. So expose 709-800 so it looks nice and your S-Log recording, whether that's S-Log 2 or S-Log 3, will also be correctly exposed. And it really is that easy. You don't need to worry about gray cards and all of that sort of nonsense. I like to use 800 EI as my exposure index. So the recordings in the camera, they always take place at 2000 ISO in the Cine EI mode. But if you set the EI, the exposure index, to 800, it will make the viewfinder image darker. So for example, if I'd set the EI to 1000, 1000 EI is one stop darker than 2000. So the viewfinder image will be one stop darker. And as a cameraman, when you see a dark image in the viewfinder, what do you normally do? Well, you would open the aperture to compensate. So you will end up opening the aperture by one stop. And this makes the recording one stop brighter. So what you're doing is deliberately overexposing your recording a little bit. One stop is fine. Even going to 500 EI will be fine. And that results in a brighter recording that then when you take that into post-production and you grade it, you will be making those levels lower. And when you make those levels a little bit lower in the grade, that of course also brings down your noise level. So that gives you less noise in post-production and grading and that really does allow you to draw more out, pull more out of the image in the post-production process and in grading. So it's a really useful thing to do. So typically for me, 709-800 LUT, set my EI to 800, just expose by eye looking in the viewfinder or use your uh, zebras at 70%, the skin tones as you would do normally, shoot, expose like that, and you'll get really, really good results from the S-Log2 and the S-Log3. Now, there is just one issue with using the LUTs in the camera, is that with most of the LUTs, you don't see the full range that the S-Log is capable of recording. So you might be looking at your 709 image, looks lovely, but you might have some areas of overexposure, and it's a little bit difficult, you know, is it really overexposed? Because the 709 might look overexposed, but the S-Log recording quite possibly isn't overexposed. But there's a really useful feature in the camera that will take care of that for you. And it's called the high and low key function. And this has to be assigned to a signal bu uh, an assignable button to work. Now, as you're going to use this in the Cine EI mode, I normally assign this to the number two assignable button because the iris button has doesn't do anything in Cine EI. So you may as well make use of that button. And the first time you press the button, the LUT is made darker, and this allows you to see into the highlights. So you can see what's going on with your overexposure. So it's showing you the high end of your S-Log recording range. Press the button the second time, and it goes to low key, and it makes the LUT brighter, and it allows you to see what's going on in your, sh going on in your shadows, and you can see how much noise you've got in your deepest, darkest shadows. So in this illustration here, the middle picture is the standard 709-800 LUT, and 
the sky perhaps looks a little bit blown out, a little bit bright, but when you press the high key button the first time, it darkens the image, which is the top left picture on the screen here. And you can see the sky clearly isn't overexposed. There's plenty of range there. You can actually see a little bit of detail in the clouds. And you press the button again and you see the low key, which is the lower right image. And you can see into the shadows. So you can see the darkest sort of shadows in the hedge and everything else on the left of the frame and see what you're going to be able to pull out of that image when you go into post-production and start to do your grading. So the high and low key function really allows you to get the very best out of your recording. So you can use the 709-800 LUT to make exposure really easy. But if you're worried about over or under exposure, just use that high and low key function to quickly toggle between the highlights and the lowlights and you can see everything that you're actually recording. Now, in terms of workflow, well, I like to keep my workflow really simple. Now, where possible, I shoot using the XAVC-I codec. You have a choice in the camera of XAVC-I or XAVC-L. Now, XAVC-L is a long got codec, so it is more efficient. It's about two and a half times more efficient than XAVC-I. Um, but it works by recording differences between frames. And what that means is when you bring it into post-production, it requires a bit more processing power. And if you're shooting in 4K, what I find is the XAVC-L can be a little bit difficult to deal with because you need a really, really good computer. And if you've got more than a couple of streams of XAVC-L, most computers will bog down a little bit. Whereas XAVC-I, you don't have that problem. It's actually a much easier codec for the computer to decode so although the files are a bit bigger, most computers will find working with XAVC-I much easier. I shoot on the XQD cards. Uh, I use a mix of Sony uh, XQD, the G-series cards, um, and also the uh, Alexa 1333 times cards. They will also work with the camera. When the card's full, I back it up to two hard disk drives. I make a minimum of two copies. So if I was to drop a drive or one of the hard drives was to fail, I'd still have a copy of my material. And then I will edit normally directly off those drives. A general USB 3 drive is normally plenty fast enough for editing XAVC material from. I do recommend the use of the Next2DI NSB25 or NVS2825 if you are short of media. Um, it's shown here in this picture, and the, this is the, the 2825, and it's about the size of a, a large paperback book, uh, self-contained, it's battery powered, you can get up to a one terabyte um, drive internally, and you pop your XQD card into it, and it will just say, do you want to back up this card, yes or no? Press one button, and it backs up the card. A 64 gigabyte card takes about seven minutes to back up, so it's very, very fast to back up that card. And you know, maybe it means you don't need to have so much XQD media because you can have this thing sitting by the side of the camera and you can be backing up your media while you're shooting. And it does make for a very good workflow. The backups are all verified. So your backups are very safe. It's got all sorts of drop sensors and other things to protect the media. And then it has a USB port. So when you get back to the studio, you just plug it into the computer and edit directly off it. Really useful tool uh, in the field. The NSB25, which I don't have a picture of here, is a bigger unit about the size of a house brick. And that has two drives internally. It will make two simultaneous copies as well as a third copy to an external USB 3 drive if you want to. I normally edit using Adobe Premiere CC. Um, just really easy with XAVC. You don't need to worry about uh, the codec. It just goes straight into CC. And now you can export from Adobe CC. Uh, when you've done your edit, if you uh, click on the export function, when the export window opens up, if you select MXF OP1A as your output option, you will see that there are now drops down, drop downs and presets for the XAVC codec. And you can export MXF XAVC files that you can drop back onto an XQD card to play back in the camera. To drop the files back onto the camera, you have to use Sony's Catalyst Browse. And you open your XQD card in Catalyst Browse, and then open the files in Browse and export them from Catalyst Browse to the XQD card. And that creates all the other XML files and everything else that's needed. Put the card back in the camera, and you can play your edit back 
in the camera, which is a really useful thing for conferences, corporate events, etc., where you may need to show your footage back at the end of the day. If I'm doing something with S-Log, S-Log 2 or S-Log 3, then I will normally grade using DaVinci Resolve. I really think for S-Log material, grading in Resolve or a proper grading tool really, really is uh, a much better way to go, trying to grade it in Premiere. It's a fairly limited tool, even SpeedGrade, well, SpeedGrade doesn't handle XABC properly at the moment, so there's a bit of a problem there. Um, the tools that most edit applications have for grading are not really suitable for log. They're working in a linear space, well, log footage is log, and you'll get strange things happening, like you might get your skin tones right and the highlights just suddenly blow out. Whereas if you go into Resolve and use the log tools, you'll find it much easier to grade. Um, so we've got um, a few questions um, that have come in. I'm just looking at these questions. And one that's come up actually is about hypergammas and whether I stick to one or two or, or use a lot. And uh, with the hypergammas, I tend to stick to just one or two. And that's normally hypergamma number three or four. Uh, if I'm using hypergammas, I'm using them because I want something that looks good direct to air. Um, seven and eight are really good. They're, they're very popular. I know a lot of people use hypergamma seven and eight, but for me, I find them a little bit too flat. I prefer to have uh, a slightly more contrasty picture if I'm going direct to air. So I tend to use hypergamma number three when I don't have large dynamic ranges to deal with. And then I'll use hypergamma number four uh, for bright daylight exteriors and things like that where uh, contrast dynamic range is a bit more of a challenge. Um, seven and eight I do use, but I, I, I find them a little bit flat. Um, I mean, there's no right or wrong way to do these things. You have to pick what works for you. And if you think one of the hypergammas gives you a better looking picture, then use that one by all means. You know, the, the, use the one that works for you. But my favorites are three and four. Now, another question that's come in is uh, what difference does the EI setting make when you're burning in a look to your footage? For example, um, maybe using the LC709 type A codec. So um, yes, uh, you do still get a noise improvement when you use a lower EI. Um, it's when you're baking in the look. So what, what we're talking about here is baking in the look. So that would be when you are using the Cine EI mode and you've turned on the LUTs on SDI1 and internal recording. So um, let me just see, I might have some slides actually to illustrate this. Let me just see if I can um, quickly uh, bring those up. Let's see if this will work. Otherwise, I will just um, talk about it anyway. Um, so what you're doing is you're turning on the internal recording and SDI1 LUT. And that allows you to then record the LUT. Um, something that's really important to bear in mind when you're doing this is really when you turn on that SDI1 and internal recording option, there should be all sorts of alarm bells and sirens going off and ringing because it's really important to understand that you are not recording S-Log anymore. As soon as you do that, you are recording the LUT and whatever the gamma of the LUT is. But some people like to do it because it allows them to use uh, let's say the LC709 Type A LUT, which sort of mimics an Arri Alexa in 709 to a degree, or a custom LUT that you might have created to create a very stylized look. And when you do that, EI will make the LUT brighter and darker. And just like using gain with a conventional camera, if you have lower gain and you then open the aperture to let more light in, you will have less noise in the same way as using a low EI means that you open the aperture, let more light in onto the sensor, so there's more signal relative to noise, so you get a better signal to noise ratio, you will have less grain in your pictures. But something to consider is that the same actually as with a conventional camera, when you use gain that is lower than the camera's native gain, it can affect your highlight range. So as you, if you were to use, say, 500 or 800 EI on many of the LUTs, your recording won't actually reach 100%. In fact, in some cases, it might only reach 90%. And you are, in effect, losing dynamic range off the top end uh, unless the LUT has been specifically created to compensate for that. So there are some issues 
with using LUTs, with baking that look in and using low EIs, um, you really have to sort of look at the pictures, look at the, get a bigger monitor if you can, and, and really sort of have a look at what's going on. So um, really, please do keep asking those questions. It would be really good to, to have plenty of questions to answer rather than me just waffling on all afternoon <laughs> on what I think might be the right thing to talk about, because it might not be the right thing to talk about. I'm coming back to this thing about LC709 type A, actually, and um, Cine EI, is the LC709 type A is very popular. Um, in part, I think that comes from the fact that it's called the ARILUT, the, the, the type A bit, um, stands for type Alexa, um, because it does mimic um, the ARI Alexa. Um, but one thing to bear in mind is anybody shooting with an ARI Alexa in 709, it's still going to be graded. It's not meant to really go direct to air. And the correct exposure level for it, actually, if you set middle gray at 41%, which is the correct middle gray for 709, you'll find that with the 709 Type A LUT, that whites will be at 70%. So that actually means that to get skin tones to have good contrast, you're going to have to put your skin tones down at 55, 60%. They're going to be very dark compared to what you would normally have for television exposure. And that's fine for movies and features and drama, because actually skin tones in movies, features and dramas do tend to be much lower than for normal daytime TV. Daytime TV, we typically put skin tones around about 70%, 65%, 70%. Movies and drama skin tones are very often between 55 and 65%. So um, yeah, just bear that in mind if you do want to use it. It's not really meant as something to go direct to air, but obviously some people like that look, uh, and that's fine. If, you, if that's the look that you're after, go ahead, go right ahead and use it. I would still encourage people where possible to actually shoot in S-Log, use S-Log2 or S-Log3, record S-Log2, S-Log3, take it into post-production and then apply the LUT in post. You'll have exactly the same look, um, but the ability, of course, because you've shot S-Log2 or S-Log3 to grade it. So if you do change your mind, if you do need a better shadow range or highlight, highlight range, you've got it because you shot in S-Log3 um, or S-Log2, and it gives you much more flexibility. And adding a LUT in post is very easy and very fast. It takes virtually no time at all. In Adobe Premiere CC, for example, you can um, just go into the timeline, put your clip in the timeline, and using the Lumetri plugin, which is found in the color correction filters um, uh, window, just drag that Lumetri plugin onto the clip. It'll ask you for the LUT pop it on your clip and you've got um, a really good you know, look straight away. You'd, and But because you've recorded S-Log, you can change that LUT and use different LUTs. So questions coming in on this subject actually. So uh, one of the things is what's the downside of using S-Log in the custom mode instead of the Cine EI mode? Um, there's, you, you can use S-Log in custom mode. There's no reason really why not to, but you do need to consider that you need to make sure and ensure that all your detail settings and things like that are off. The default is off, so they should be off anyway. But one thing that can cause a few problems is with S, you want to use S-Log2. S-Log3, you're only going to go to 94% uh, as your peak white, so you'll never really have a very bright image. So you really want to use S-Log2. And you're going to have um, S-Log2 gamma uh, with linear 709 color space and that can result in color shifts when you're grading if you're doing any extensive color changes. Um, I would always always if you're going to shoot log try and do it in the Cine EI mode rather than in uh, the, the custom mode. There, there are too many things that can go wrong in custom mode. For example if you were to use a, a gain level or an ISO that isn't the standard native ISO of the camera, so 2000 EI, if you're not using that, you will lose dynamic range. And if you're losing dynamic range, you are defeating the whole point of using S-Log. So really try and stay in S-Log, uh, in Cine EI mode. You will get the best results doing it that way. It's the way it's designed to be used. Um, sorry, I'm just, just looking at the other questions here. Uh, a recommended technique to match the FS7 to other cameras, for example, FS700. Um, it's a little bit difficult. The, the, one of the problems you've got there is one of the easy ways to do it would be to run the FS7 in 709 using standard gamma number five. 
um, and then run the FS100 in its standard out of the factory settings, and they will be fairly close. But then you're going to be running very limited uh, dynamic range. Um, you could perhaps use, and I can't remember, I wish I could remember actually, I'd have to look at my website. One of the cine gammas and one of the hyper gammas do actually match. And I think if I remember right, it is uh, cine gamma ooh, one is the same as hyper gamma three. Please don't, don't, um, don't uh, take that. Let me just see, I might have a slide here on that. Uh, no, I don't think I do. Um, I'd have to, you'd have to look, if you go to my website, xdcamuser.com, you'll find which cine gamma and hyper gamma matches. You could do it that way, but again, you're limiting your dynamic range. It's not necessarily the best setup for both cameras. Um, one way you can do it is a piece of software called LUTCALC, and LUTCALC is free if you just Google LUTCALC, L-U-T-C-A-L-C, and that allows you to create custom lookup tables. Now, it might sound really complicated, but it isn't. The software is quite easy to use. You just tell it that you're using an FS7, and then you'll see under the output options for the LUT, you can choose lots of different possibilities. So you can have Canon, for example, uh, Canon C-Log, and various Canon uh, color spaces. So if you were trying to match Canon cameras, you could use LUT calc to create a LUT that will match the FS7 to a Canon C300 or a Panasonic uh, gamma as well. So that's another way of matching the FS7 uh, to other cameras. So uh, other questions. Um, is the native ISO for S-Log2 and S-Log3 the same? Yes, it is. So S-Log2 and S-Log3 are both 2000 ISO. The picture will appear slightly brighter and darker. So S-Log2 will tend to give um, slightly brighter highlights, but uh, darker uh, low and mid range, while the S-Log3 will give you a brighter mid range, but your highlights will be darker. That's just differences in the characteristics of the two curves. The, in terms of the noise in the two curves, if you view S-Log2 and S-Log3 side by side, they both appear to be very uh, similar, but sometimes a lot of people complain that S-Log2 appears to be noisy, sorry, S-Log3 appears to be noisy. Well, that's because S-Log3 is recording the shadows and the, the low range brighter than S-Log2 does. But of course, when you take your S-Log2 or your S-Log3 into post-production and you grade it with a like-for-like -like grade, so if you're going to put those shadows and those uh, low, uh, low key details at the same brightness in your finished grade, then the noise is exactly the same for both S-Log2 and S-Log3. So that's, that's just something to bear in mind. Uh, personally, I prefer to use S-Log3 because it's very close to the Cineon log curve and also very close to Ari's log C. So lookup tables designed for those curves will normally work quite well with S-Log3 as well. And there's lots more curves to choose from as a result. And also S-Log3 has a, what we would call a longer straight line portion. So if you were to plot the curve um, on a chart, uh, and I do have a chart for this. Um, if we look at this chart here, the S-Log2 curve is much more of a curve. Um, really, it's actually still curving all the way here, up through middle gray and up into almost the skin tone region. And it's not until we get to about here that it becomes a straight line. And what this means is when you're grading, that any changes you made in this curved area will have a different impact to changes in the straight line area. So it means grading is a little bit more fiddly. You tend to have to grade the shadows, the mid range, and the highlights separately. Whereas S-Log3, if you look at the line, it's a much straighter line, even from around about here, just below middle gray and all the way up, it's a straight line. And that means that um, your grading is more consistent when you make a mid-range change, you'll get the same change in the highlights and a very similar change in the shadows. Just makes grading, grading a little bit quicker and a little bit easier. Um, quickest and easiest way to match an FS7 to an FS700. Um, yeah, S-Log2 uh, would be the way to go. Um, use, uh, is it profile, picture profile six or seven? I can't remember, my memory's gone a bit, bit weak on the FS700, but set the FS700 to its native ISO and shoot native ISO, standard settings on the FS700 and then FS7 as well. 
set that to S log two, then the contrast range will be exactly the same. Um, they should be very, very close matches, the FS7 and the FS700, because they share the same sensor. There will be some small differences because the processing is different. The processing in the FS7 is much more advanced. It's a, a, a more advanced processor, so it's done at a greater bit depth. So there's a bit more detail in the shadows and things like that from the FS7. Um, other questions. Um, will S-Log with 709 burnt in still give you more flexibility than just shooting 709 if you don't have much time to grade and don't mind the look of 709? Uh, no, it won't. You'll have the same, same flexibility. Um, if you are burning in 709, you are recording 709. So it's, it's just plain vanilla 709. So whether you choose to burn in 709 or whether you just use custom mode and 709, it's the same thing. So there is no benefit. It's As I say, it's really important to, to consider that whenever you burn in that LUT, when you bake in that LUT, you are no longer recording S-Log2. So forget all about S-Log2. As soon as you turn on um, the lookup table on SDI1, an internal recording, you're no longer shooting log. You have given up the benefits of shooting log largely. You're now shooting something else. So you do need to, to just to bear, in that, bear that in mind as soon as you start baking in stuff. It's no longer S-Log anymore. Um, how do I decide between shooting S-Log 2 and S-Log 3? And in which situations do they fare better? Well, really, they fare pretty much the same in all situations. S-Log 2 is a bit of an engineering masterpiece. Sony are really good at engineering stuff. And they engineered S-Log 2 to get the most uh, as much data as possible uh, in a 10-bit recording. So it's a 10-bit recording. And um, let me just see, I should have uh, an illustration of this somewhere. Um, let me just find the right slide. Uh, bear with me a second, here we are. So S-Log2 has around about 70 gray shades per stop compared to S-Log3, which has around 60 gray shades per stop. So from a real sort of pixel peeping engineering point of view, S-Log2 uh, on paper appears to be the better curve overall. There is a little bit more data in the shadows with S-Log3 than S-Log2, but it's a very small difference. But in practice, because S-Log3 is generally easier to grade than S-Log2, a lot of people will find that although S-Log3 has a little bit more data per stop and it only goes up to, to 94%, so it doesn't actually go up to 100, but that's nothing to worry about. That's just the way the data is distributed. That's it's designed like that. Um, but most people actually find S log three easier to grade. And in particular, actually, one of the key things is that when you shoot with S log two, you're tied to S gamut, which is Sony's original gamut. And again, this is another engineering masterpiece. It captures a lot more green information than it does red and blue um, to try and mimic the way the real world is. There's a lot more green light than, than red or blue. And the problem you get there, though, is because there's more green than red or blue, when you start making saturation changes in post, you get a color shift. So you might get your skin tones and everything all looking really nice. And then the producer or director comes in and says, well, you know, can you can you bring up the saturation a little bit? And you do. And that introduces then a slight color shift because you're altering that RGB ratio a little bit because of the way the things skewed towards green with S gamut too. With S log three, you have the choice of S gamut three or S gamut three cine. And both of these have been adjusted to give a much, much better color response. The, the, the colors you get from S log from S gamut three are, in my opinion, far superior to those from S gamut. So I would always rather have S gamut three. And on the FS7, because the sensor gamut is a little bit limited anyway, it can't actually fill S gamut three you're better off using S Gamut 3 Cine. It's a much better match to the FS7. It gives you much better blues, um, water, um, things like that tends to look much more realistic. The sky is a nicer shade of blue. And by combining S Gamut 3 Cine and S Log 3, I find it much easier to grade and the end result is much better. So I almost always shoot with S Log 3. The only exception to that would be if for some reason I was shooting in custom mode using S-Log2 and 709 color. And the only 
only real reason I would do that if I wanted to shoot something that I didn't want to grade or very minimal grading and it didn't have skin tones in it. I wouldn't shoot people and faces doing that. I just don't think the result is great. I'd rather use the Cine EI mode to do that. Um, other questions. So can I recommend a best EI setting for LC709 type A? Um, and just actually while I'm here, we've got about um, uh, 12 or 14 minutes to go. So do keep um, firing those questions in. Sometimes they can take a few moments to reach us. So do get going with those questions. We've got uh, uh, a little bit of time to answer some more. Um, so EI for using a baked in LUT, I would again probably normally go to about a thousand EI. I wouldn't go down below that because you are going to, to bring your headroom down and you'll actually see that you won't ever get to 100%. So at 800 or a thousand EI, you'll just about get to 100% recording. If you go below 800, you will not. You'll be below 100%. And that really is just throwing away data. Um, as I say, really, I would urge you where possible, though, to actually record S-Log. Don't bake the LUT in, add it in post. It's so easy to add in post in Premiere using the Lumetri plugin uh, in Resolve by dropping the LUT on your clip. Or in um, FCP10, there are plugins that will allow you to apply LUTs directly to your clips in FCP as well. And it's the same thing as, yeah, bake it in in the camera or apply it in post. The end picture looks the same, but do it in post. You can change your mind, use different LUTs, and, and really sort of create lots and lots of different looks. Now, another question here is, is the output through the HDMI the same quality when the output is set to monitor rather than data recorder? Now, that's a good question. Um, I'm not entirely sure is the answer to that. Um, I believe the quality is pretty much the same. I think the difference is that when the output is set to monitor, you can have overlays and LUTs and things like that. But when it's set to recorder, it does limit some of those options so you don't accidentally have text overlays in your image when you're recording. As, but I certainly haven't seen any difference in the image quality um, that I'm, I'm aware of. I don't tend to use the H HDMI out to go to, to a recorder. I really don't like HDMI. HDMI is prone to interference. It is prone to all kinds of issues. A poor quality cable can reduce the quality of your recordings, whereas um, HDSDI is far more reliable. It doesn't come unplugged easily, and uh, it's much less prone to interference and things like that from cell phones and all those sorts of things that you might find on a set. Um, can I recommend resources that I can share with us to learn more about S-Log LUTs and the FS7 and uh, FS700? Uh, well, I do have uh, my website, um, but if you um, fire an email off to uh, Visual Impact to, to Rob at Visuals, he will um, email you back with some links that you can uh, look at. What we'll do is we'll set up a Dropbox uh, link for you, um, and we can forward that link to you. I'm a wildlife cameraman used to using an 18 times B format lens. Is there a decent 18 times converter or combination you can recommend? Um, well, I developed an adapter which MTF cell that allows you to use B4 lenses with doublers with the FS7. So that's MTF services sell that. Uh, what I would say is that um, the two third inch lenses that you typically use uh, on your two inch camera, they have a certain look to them. And if you put one of those lenses on an FS7 or a camera like that, it's not going to look the same as if you use a good quality PL or DSLR lens. There are lots and lots of glass elements in those big ratio zoom ranges to give those huge zoom range ranges. And they're generally, you know, they're only designed for HD um, because they're also designed to work with cameras with an optical block. They have some compensation for the optical block, although we do have compensation in the converter but you tend to get a slightly, uh, I don't want to use the word softer, but there is a definite look to those lenses. So if you need the zoom range, uh, say a wildlife cameraman, then those adapters, they work really, really well. Just don't expect it to look any different to the way it would look if you were using it on a two third inch lens. Um, so other questions. Um, 
What's the furthest you would push the gain and EI in a low light situation and still get reasonable results? Um, okay, so in a low light situation, uh, to be honest, I probably would, uh, uh, you're gonna be recording in EI at 2000 ISO. So your, your recording ISO isn't gonna change. Um, you just want to open your iris up as much as you can and you'll add your gain in post. One of the beauties of that adding gain in post is you can selectively add it to different parts of the image if you're using something like Resolve. If I'm in custom mode and if I'm really struggling with light, I'll go into custom mode. I won't use S-Log. You'll only have a limited amount of data per stop. Really with low light, high contrast and high dynamic range isn't going to be an issue. So use a hypergamma, use hypergamma number three, or use just plain vanilla 709, which is gonna give you the maximum data uh, per stop. And then I would push the gain um, probably to, you know, up to 6,000 ISO, uh, which is plus uh, 12 dB if I had to. Um, I, I wouldn't go really much beyond that. Uh, it does start to get a bit noisy and a bit grainy. But again, it's going to depend on you know, what your limits are. How, what, what do you think is acceptable? And the only way to choose decide on that is to look at the pictures for yourself uh, and make a decision. Um, wherever possible, I want to stay at 2000 ISO or the native ISO of the camera. And, and the best thing is to try and get faster lenses, you know, bigger aperture, let more light in. Uh, I really like the Samyang Prime lenses. They're, they're low cost, they're cheap lenses, but they go, they're uh, f1.4, t1.5, so really good in low light. Uh, the other thing you can consider doing if you're shooting progressive and struggling for low light is to turn the shutter off. And when you turn the shutter off, if you're shooting at 25 frames per second, that gives you a 1 25th exposure and again gets more light in. Yes, there will be a little bit of um, smear and blur in the image if you're panning quickly because it's a long shutter but I'd rather have that over a grainy and noisy picture so I'll tend to use anything other than gain where possible with any camera to, to really try and get the, the best kind of things. Um, now the some questions about the 28 to 135 millimeter kit lens that Sony offer. Um, I think it's a really good lens you have to put this lens into some perspective it is 28 to 135, so it's a good zoom range. It's par focal, so it holds focus throughout that range. It's f4, which isn't unreasonable. Yeah, sure, it's not an f1.8. We'd all love a 28 to 135 f1.8. Who wouldn't? Um, but f4 is a very usable aperture. Um, I think it's worth considering that this lens is, was it wrong, about 2,000 pounds, something like that to buy. Um, the nearest equivalent to it, you're looking at something like a Fujinon Cabrio, which is 10 times that price. It's 20, 30,000 pound lens. So the 28 to 135, it's not a perfect lens. The zoom speed is a little bit slow. Even if you drive it manually, it doesn't zoom in and out terribly quickly. But I think that's a small price to pay for what you get because optically it's pretty good. Um, it, you know, it's constant f4. The focus doesn't shift as it does with a DSLR lens, and that means it's a really straightforward, easy lens to use. And yes, you can use it for run and gun. You just have to be aware that you're not going to be able to crash zoom with it. Now we're starting to um, run out of time a little bit here, so we're not gonna have time for many more questions. Um, another thing about that lens is, does it need a support plate to support it? No, it doesn't, it's not particularly heavy. It is worth bearing in mind that the E-mount that the FS7 does have is basically designed for DSLR type lenses. So if you are going to use very heavy lenses, um, for example, a Fujinon Cabrio, um, or a, a big long 600 mil uh, fast lens, something like that, then for those sorts of lens, yes, you probably will need to use an additional lens support um, to, to take some of the load off that E-mount interface. Um, and what's the difference between using a LUT and just grading the S-Log image in color correction? Well, one of the things is a LUT will restore your image to the correct linear range. It actually should make uh, grading easier. Um, apply the LUT, then grade. If you're using a proper grading tool like Resolve, it doesn't matter where you put the LUT, you just add your LUT and then grade on top. Uh, if you're using something like Premiere, you add your LUT and then in your filter stack, you need to do any color corrections uh, higher up in that stack so your color correction is done before 
the application of the LUT. Something to bear in mind, of course, is that if you're bringing in a, an image that's got dark shadows and things, one of the things that you'll do very often to bring those shadows up when you're grading is add gain. And adding gain in post-production adds noise. Whenever you add gain, whether it's in the camera or in post, it will make your picture noisier. However, a LUT simply converts ranges from one to another. So when you apply a 709 LUT, for example, it will convert from your S log 2 or S log 3 range to 709 and in the process bring those darker areas of the picture up without applying gain so the picture won't get as noisy. So I really do recommend using LUTs where you can. Now we're really starting to run out of time here so I'm going to hand over to Rob who's going to wrap up for us. Okay thanks very much Alice that was really interesting. I hope you got some good hints and tips there for our listeners, thanks very much also to your questions. They were certainly diverse and, uh, again, kept Alistair on his toes, which is brilliant. Uh, just to wrap up, I'd like to thank you for attending. Hope you enjoyed it. As I said, we, I said earlier, we will be sending you a recording of this. Hopefully you can join us again either on the next webinar or in person when we have an event here at Teddington. Thanks very much. Thanks for listening, guys. Um, so any uh, anything that we couldn't answer today, just uh, fire an email to Rob. We'll try and address them where we can.